Hello and welcome to Transmitting Until Robots Replace Us. My name is Drew, call sign AC3DS. And today, we're gonna talk about feed lines. Now, feed lines are everything that runs from your antenna to your radio, or from your radio to your antenna. It's everything that's in between. And typically, it's going to be coaxial cable. The exterior of a coaxial cable is called the jacket. And the jacket is typically black, and it serves two main functions. So the first is to protect everything on the inside from uh, moisture, uh, from moisture penetration and from UV degradation. And the second main function is just to keep everything on the inside together and neat and tidy. You can get ones made out of PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride, PVC type 2, which is just a new formula of PVC. Uh, then you can also get it made out of PE, which is polyethylene, and then finally TPE, which is a thermoplastic elastomer. Each of these has different properties, and it's worth considering what your application is to decide which jacket is the right one for you. There are some general characteristics which are known, though, and uh, are worth understanding. First of all, PE, polyethylene. PE has been around for a long time and has been the uh, recommended uh, jacket for direct burial situations. Where moisture is highly likely, uh, PE does a great job of keeping moisture out of the coaxial cable. PVC type 2, as I understand it, is also an excellent choice for keeping moisture out. Now, PVC is a little bit different in that it is not as ideal for low temperature or high temperature uh, scenarios. So extreme colds especially make PVC brittle. Um, now it's, it's worth noting that TPE, thermoplastic elastomer, is really great for repeated bends. It's very flexible, whereas PE is not great, um, and especially not for repeated, thermoplastic elastomer is going to do a much better job and, and hold up much better in the long term for repeated bending. The second part of a coaxial feed line is the shield. Now, the shield is often going to be a braid. In, it's often a braid of either copper, tinned copper, or silver plated. And depending on what that composition is will affect it slightly, um, and it's worth understanding a little bit about. Now, the shield in many cases does carry the ground of the antenna uh, and the, the radio. Um, so it, it, is, it is a used part, right? It's not something just to be ignored. Um, now the, the shield uh, can also be uh, hard, it can be solid, um, and that's in the case of hard lines like a heliax uh, where it's a corrugated copper. And, but that's just not something that's very common for a new operator to be, you know, utilizing. Um, so in most cases, you're going to be looking at a braid, and in most cases, it's going to be copper or tinned copper. All right, next up we have the foil. Now the foil is meant as an extra layer of protection between the dielectric and the shield, and it's, again, just kind of helping to shield that center conductor from the shield. Now, the foil is not present on all coaxial cables. Um, it tends to be there on some of maybe the slightly more expensive ones uh, and or slightly heavier ones, but maybe not there on some of the less. But that's not always true. After the foil comes the dielectric material. Now, the dielectric generally comes in one of three different flavors. It's either a solid, it's a foam, or it's air. Now, the air is really uncommon. Air is in very expensive installations where you have, uh, you know, a, a very, very um, specific use case scenario. Um, that's not what we're going to be talking about, and it's not what most uh, amateurs are starting with when they're just getting into the hobby. Um, so what you're going to deal with is either foam or solid. Now, it's worth noting that whether it's foam or solid has an impact on the lossy nature of the cable. Um, foam, if I remember correctly, tends to be a little less lossy than solid, but again, it depends. There's, there's, there's give and take there. 
but ultimately the whole purpose of that insulating layer, uh, that dielectric, is to separate that center conductor from the shield and create a, a barrier between the two. And that's what it does. Finally, we get to the center of our coaxial cable, and that is the conductor. Now, the center conductor wire is usually either solid copper or it is made out of stranded copper. Now, whether it's solid or stranded um, will depend on, again, your particular use case. Solid is not going to be able to uh, bend over on itself as easily. Uh, it's also not great for repeated bends, uh, whereas stranded is going to be better for something like that. But there you have it, the anatomy of a coaxial cable. All feed lines share certain attributes. And the first we're gonna talk about is flexibility. This is a coil of RG58. And I can do quite a bit with this RG58 in terms of compressing it, rolling it, unrolling it, coiling it up uh, into some really tight coils and some really large ones as well. Um, it's really nice, really flexible, but it's also very lossy on certain frequencies. Um, so, but the flexibility is, is really nice. Now, if I were to compare that to, say, something like my uh, RG8X, my RG8X is also pretty flexible, but it's definitely less flexible than the RG58. Um, it can still be coiled up and we can still get some, some radius in the coil bends, but, um, you know, some smaller bones, but it's a little bit less. When we start moving up into some bigger cables, we start to deal with a lot less flexibility. So this is some RG8U cable, uh, and it is significantly less flexible. When you're trying to choose a cable and you're looking at the flexibility and they talk about that minimum bend radius, what they're talking about is how big of a, uh, of a bend you have to have in terms of either keeping it in a solid configuration or if you're going to be repeatedly uh, coiling it and, and uncoiling it. So make sure that you're paying attention to what your application is as to what particular type of cable you want to, to use. So this is RG8U. I have some RG214 here, which is pretty much the same uh, in terms of uh, flexibility as the RG8U. But then we can get into some other ones like uh, LMR400, LMR600, which are significantly thicker and they really don't like to bend much at all. I know that my uh, DXE400 Max uh, from DX Engineering that I used uh, out to my, uh, my main antenna, uh, I was very surprised when I first got that and I, and I saw how little it wanted to bend. Um, it works, works great, love it, but you just have to be conscious of of what kind of space you're working in and knowing how much that thing is, is really going to be flexible. All right, the next attribute of coaxial feed lines is the power rating. And the power rating really depends on the frequency that you're using. For instance, this, this RG8U is capable of handling anywhere from 1,000 watts up to 6,000 watts, depending on the frequency. Now, if you're using a standard 100 watt radio uh, that's, you know, again, putting out 100 watts that's going across this feed line, you're in really good shape. RG8U is going to work perfectly for something like that. Um, however, if you're looking to utilize an amplifier and you're looking to push that legal maximum, then you need to be paying attention to the power rating of the particular cable that you're utilizing. So this might be fine for 1,000 watts, whereas this RG58 probably is not. So be sure to check the specifications the power, uh, of the power rating if you're going to be using anything beyond that 100 watt um, standard. The next attribute is attenuation or loss inside of a cable. Depending on the coaxial cable that you're using, it will have a different level of loss. And it's important to know that for every three decibels of loss that you have at any given frequency, you're losing half of the power that you're putting into that cable. So let's say, for instance, if this RG8U 
had three decibels of loss for every 100 feet. And I was putting 100 watts into it, and I had a 100 foot run of this cable, then at the other end, I would be getting out 50 watts. Because again, three decibels of loss, 100 feet of cable, and we're getting a loss of half of the power. Now, I say 100 feet just because that's often typically what's utilized um, you know, on the spec sheets, on the data sheets of cable when you're purchasing it. They'll tell you how much loss there is per 100 feet at a specified frequency. The final attribute is the velocity factor. Now, the velocity factor is a ratio or a relationship between uh, the particular cable that you're using and the perfect cable that's going to operate at the speed of light. Now, the velocity of the signal that's traveling, the velocity of the waveform as it's moving across the cable, is affected by the dielectric that's utilized in your particular coaxial cable. So you're going to see uh, percentages anywhere from around 60% up to in the 80s, 90% range. Um, and it's important, however, it's not mission critical necessarily always. Feed lines get you from point A to point B, and there's a lot to learn and understand about them. They're not as simple as they initially appear, but they're not overly complex either. Do your research, understand uh, what the characteristics are of the feed lines, and you should be in pretty good shape when you go to set up your next radio adventure. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, if it was helpful for you, please feel free to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, and share the video. Thanks for watching. Until next time.